All right, we're gonna talk about fire ground responsibilities, specifically staying in your lane. One of the things that we've seen with a lot of our newer firefighters, we don't have a lot of experience behind us. When we get on scene, we see people going down different paths, doing different things, and uh, all of a sudden it happens on scene is we see these big response times on scene. We show, we see people showing up, it takes a long time to get water on a fire. We see people show up and it takes them 15, 20 minutes to prep a car for doing vehicle extrication. And the reason we're seeing a lot of that is instead of people kind of having specific tasks that they're accomplishing, when they show up on scene, they're just bouncing around between each other. And so what we're gonna talk about in this program is basically seeing if we can't keep you staying in your lane. So set some goals for you and help you focus on the tasks that need to be completed. Just like in an operating room, everybody has a task. We have the surgeon has their task. The nurses have their tasks. Respiratory therapist has their tasks. They don't bounce back and forth between each other. They each have their jobs. And then we call it again, stand in your lane. When they stay in their lane, the surgery goes very well. If they start bouncing around, things don't go so well for them. Same thing for us on our fire scenes and our medical scenes. If you figure out your tasks, stay in your lane, it's gonna go very well for you. All right, we talked about staying in your lane. So as far as it relates to emergency response, we're gonna talk about mission creep. We're gonna talk about tactical delays. We're gonna talk about the primary skills that we need to know. Some of the issues we're into, if people don't understand their primary skills, then they don't do them. And we're also going to talk about secondary skills. So once you get the primary on scene done, what do we do? From there, secondary skills, and also talk about apparatus setup. All right, when we're talking about mission creep, we're talking about if I've got, this is my primary job I need to get done, on scene I get squirreled real easy, right? We start seeing a different task, and then a different task, and a different task, and all of a sudden on scene, I'm supposed to be doing fire attack, but now I'm throwing salvage tarps. So all of a sudden now, what's happening to fire attack? It's not happening. So when we talk about mission creep on scene, figure out your job you need to get done, do that job, and report back for reassignments. Mission creep typically happens for one of two reasons. Either I don't understand what my job is, what my job function is, and I don't get that job done, I start, start deviating, or it comes from my company officer who didn't give me clear orders of what they want done. If they've kind of given me a broad range of go make it better. Well, what does go make it better mean, right? It means different things to different people. So, you know, again, to keep out, keep away from mission creep, make sure that as company officers, you're giving your crews very clear directions. And us as crews, when we're in there doing our work, make sure that we understand exactly what you want done. A couple of examples of mission creep. We've all been on fires when somebody's been assigned to bring in a water supply, and all of a sudden we're trying to find where our water supply's at, and I see somebody throwing a ladder to a roof. And I realize, hey, that's my water supply rig. Why are they doing that, right? So again, keep staying that task. Think about our medical calls. Have you ever been on a medical call when I've assigned somebody to do a chest exam and all of a sudden what's happening? They're down there looking at the toes. So again, stay in your lane. Company officers, ultimately mission creep falls to you. You need to make sure that you're giving good, clear communications to your crew of what you want done. Make sure from command you understand what they want done. So that, right, make sure we have that closed loop. Hey guys, here's what I want accomplished. Make sure they repeat that back to you and you've got exactly goals of what we want done. When you're doing your training, same thing. Make sure that we're training people to accomplish your goal given to you and come back for reassignment. Once you've got your reassignment, go back and do your next goal. Once that's done, come back for reassignment. That way we know what's happening. And we're able to communicate that up the chain through company officers, up to command, for command back down and we understand what's happening and the scene should flow very smoothly for us. One of the other things that we run into the problems of not staying in your lane is tactical delays. We talk about tactical delays. If we don't get the correct hose line in the correct place and start getting water put on, the fire gets bigger. As the fire gets bigger, now we're behind the curve and we keep fighting that. So when we start looking at when we get on scene, what's our, what's our goals? How do we prevent the tactical delays? It's understanding your mission. When I've got uh, limited resources, I'm gonna have a wider mission of goals to accomplish. When I've got a lot of resources on scene, my mission is gonna narrow down. But again, understand what you get on scene, understand your mission. For the mission, if I get the mission done correctly, then that prevents the tactical delays. Understanding your primary skill set when we get on scene is key to having successful scenes. So here we got a picture, we're showing an example here of a crew getting on scene. One person's job was to set the outriggers out, another person's job was to fly the stick. Well, if we get on scene, if somebody didn't understand their jobs, the outriggers didn't get put down, we start flying the stick, what happens? We tip the truck over. We see the same thing happening on other calls, right? We don't get a hose lines put, pulled correctly. We don't get forcible entry tools brought up to the door. All of those will equal delays in our scene and cause the thing to go worse. The two best ways we've found to prevent these issues from happening, number one is training. Make sure that you know when you show up on scene what your job is, how to do your job. Secondly, it comes down again to communication. That company officer needs to be communicating to the crew what they want done and how to do it on scene. So when I get on scene, hey, I need a hose line on the, on the Charlie side of the structure. And again, closed loop from the firefighter back up, copy that. 
tri hose line to the tri side of the structure. Once that's done, if you don't understand what to do next, again, communicate back. Review the report back to company officer or make sure you have that before you leave the cab. Hey, after I get the hose line pulled, do you want me to flow water? Do you want me to come back to you? What do you want done? Make sure we keep, again, closed loop communication. This can prevent a lot of this from happening. All right, understanding your secondary skills are very important. If, for example, we have our company officer is delayed and I've completed my initial job on scene and I can't get right back to the company officer, if I understand what my secondary skills are, we can make that happen. If I'm not, again, I can report back to the company officer, get that direction, and we keep going. After you've completed your primary skill set, your secondary skills are what kick into place. Our secondary skills might be something that we can do from the way back. So again, if, as an example, if we threw a ladder on the Charlie side as our primary, my secondary skills might be securing utilities. As I'm walking back to the front of the house and I'm walking past the utilities, go ahead and secure them. If I don't uh, have good communication with the company officer, say they're inside, I'm outside, or I'm on the wrong radio channel. If I understand my secondary skills, we can go ahead and start rolling into those. If I know my skills of what needs to be done, I can accomplish them. My company officer knows the secondary skills. So again, they know once I've completed the first set of skills, we're gonna bounce into the secondary set of skills. Just remember, completing your primary set of skills and then flowing in your secondary skills is different from bouncing lanes. When we talk about apparatus setup causing inefficiencies, we're talking about setting how we set the rigs up. A lot of times we'll see departments that set a rig up because that's how it's always been. Or we see rigs set up because this is where something fit. When we're setting up our rigs, base it on your job functions. Where we say that, we've seen rigs where they'll set up their ventilation saw is in a compartment that when the roof, when the ladder rack is down, it blocks the compartment. So now what happens when I want to ventilate a roof? Well, I either have to remember to take the saw out or get my ladders, put the ladder rack back up. So when we talk about efficiencies, set the rig up by tasks. If I can group all my extrication gear in one compartment, now we show up on scene, I throw up the door and I can complete my extrication. If we set our gear up for fire attack, I can show up, open that compartment, do my fire attack. If we set a rig up where I have to open up four different doors to get my equipment to do fire attack, what happens to our scene? It's gonna cause us delays. When we cause delays, this fire gets bigger. As the fire gets bigger, that's usually not our goal. All right, let's dig a little deeper. We're gonna dig deeper into missions. Try to identify what are the missions we want to accomplish. These missions are gonna be based on our tactical priorities. So we're gonna talk about tactical priorities. We're gonna talk about our primary skill set. When we show up on scene, what's our primary skills? We, again, if we understand them, things are gonna flow a lot smoother for us on scene. We're gonna talk a little bit about some truck ops. This is a way that we've found to really make ourselves a lot more efficient on scene. Then we're also gonna just kinda of look through a couple different pictures. We're gonna talk about some truck setups and some engine setups. As far as where I put the equipment, what makes sense, what makes things flow smoothly for us. All right, so for missions, let's talk about our engine missions. Let's talk about our truck missions and what we expect from a heavy rescue on scene. As we bounce around the country, we look at different fire departments, sometimes we'll see departments that have different ideas of what missions are. If we kind of try to stick with a primary set for most all of our apparatus, it's gonna make things flow a lot smoother. So if we think about fire engines, what's the job of a fire engine? It's to put water on the fire. Sometimes where we see this mission go sideways on us is that when we, we forget on scene that a fire engine's job is to put water on the fire. We'll see it time and time again when we watch our YouTube videos of, of departments on calls where they get there on scene and they kind of hit that analysis paralysis. So we talk about that as they get so much, so involved in pulling different hose lines and pulling five different hose lines at five different locations of the fire. You sit there and you watch, you watch it on the video and you realize that, you know, that rig's been on scene for eight minutes and they still haven't put water on the fire. As those eight minutes are taken away, what's the fire doing? The fire is getting bigger. So again, we show up on an engine, engine's job is to put water on the fire. We show up on scene, Pull hose line, it might not be the exact hose line in the exact perfect place, but if I got fire showing, get some water on that fire, slow it down, and from there we can go ahead and now start getting deeper into this and start pulling different hose lines to the different locations. But again, put water on the fire, slow it down, and then get a game plan. All right, what we've done here is we've actually set up some basis, some seat assignments for us. So we talked about our mission creep, we talked about a little bit of communication issues. A lot of those can be resolved if we understand what our job is when we get on scene. So what we've done here is just kind of, this is just a primary example. Again, tweak it to your department and what uh, you feel works best for you. But here we've talked about, we'll start with company officer. We show up on scene, a lot of times company officers want to start worrying about giving their size up right away. Well, if I get on the radio and start giving my size up, what's my crew doing? Most of our crews aren't going to be happy just sitting there. They're going to be bailing from the rig and starting to do work. So what we talk about on scene is really, when you get on scene, give your crew the directions first. Make sure that they understand what they're supposed to do. Once you've given them the directions, they can start working on their tasks. Now from you as a company officer, go ahead and give your size up. Once you've given your size up, get your 360 done. Get 360 done, right? That helps us formulate what the plan is. Helps us understand the structure, helps us understand the issues, the needs. From there, make sure we get command established. 
After we've got command established, go ahead and work with fire attack. We found, we've done a bunch of different studies over the years, and we found that company officer-led fire attacks are significantly more efficient than simply turning the firefighters loose to do their job. If we get that company officer with them to help direct them, get that experience with them, get the TI with them, and help them know where to put the water, when to put the water, our fire goes out a whole lot quicker for us. All right, the order we gave you to do this in sometimes can be a little controversial. Some departments are gonna feel that when they show up on scene, company officer's first job is to give a, is to give a size up while the crew sits there and waits. Kind of my experience has been that if I don't give the crews that assignment right off the bat, they're gonna bail on us and they're gonna start doing work. They're either, and if they don't bail, they're sitting in the cab, but they're not listening to what you're saying because they're watching the scene and they're reformulating their own plan. We get on scene as company officer, if I can go ahead and give my crew their tasks to go to accomplish and have them start doing those initial stuff, when I bounce out and I start to do my 360, I can reassign them. So a lot of times we'll give initial size up, do our 360, and I'll give a secondary size up based on what I found. I can do the same thing with my crew. We show up on scene, I can see my fire blowing out the alpha side window. I go ahead and assign my, my fire crews, go ahead and let's get water on that alpha side window from the exterior. I'll do a 360 and I come back and grab them and say, okay, let's pull secondary line. Let's go to the Charlie side. We're going to go in through the back door and we're going to initiate additional fire attack. So again, play with it how you want to, but again, also be open to that experience and see what you think. All right, so for firefighter A, this is typically the firefighter sitting behind, directly behind the company officer. We show up on scene for the firefighter A, again, just kind of understand the primary skill sets, their, their seat assignments. When you show up on scene, your job is to pull fire attack line. So get a line pulled, get water on the fire. And again, maybe it might just be, I'm putting fire on it from the exterior of the structure, I'm slowing the fire down. Company officer is gonna complete their 360, give a secondary size up, and then they're gonna come back to me as the firefighter and say, okay, here's our job. We're gonna do this, we're gonna grab another hose line, and we're gonna go advance it into the structure and do this. Where does the firefighter A task go sideways? Well, again, it goes sideways because of mission creep. We show up on scene, again, we know what slows down fire, water. So we show up on scene, your job is to put water through the window and slow the fire down. We get on scene, what does firefighters sometimes do? They get excited, they go, well, I gotta get inside the structure first. So instead of getting water on that fire in that first minute, they're spending the first three, four minutes grabbing forcible entry tools, trying to open a door, and forcing a door and getting access into the structure. I already have access when I can see the fire and I can put water right there. If I spend three, four minutes trying to force a door to then get water on the fire, how much bigger is that fire? So again, right, our job, get water on the fire, slow it down, and then we can get into the structure and finish off fire attack. All right, let's talk about firefighter B. Firefighter B is typically the one that's sitting behind the driver. So their job, we show up on a working incident, their initial job, because they're, they're sitting behind the driver, if we're gonna take a hydrant, they're gonna, that, they're gonna be the one that bails out and takes the hydrant. From there, their job is to go ahead and work on a secondary line if we need to. They're gonna work on forcible entry. So if I've got firefighter A is sitting there putting water through the window on the fire, next thing that needs to happen is we need to get that door forged to get inside, right? That's firefighter B's job is to get in there and force that door. From there, if we need a backup line, they can go ahead and pull a backup line. Or like we talked earlier, a lot of times if they, firefighter A shows up, they pull a line, they start putting water through the window. That hose line is not gonna be the right hose line or the right placement to go into the front door. Firefighter B can pull a secondary line. We put water through the window, drop that line on the ground, take that line Firefighter B is pulled and go interior with it. From there, they're gonna just assist with fire attack as needed. All right, apparatus operator on scene. So basically when we show up on scene, your job is apparatus placement is your primary thing. Apparatus placement is not something that needs to be micromanaged for us. This is typically something that we should have practiced and we should know what we're doing, how we're gonna park the rig. Do I need to park the rig for safety? Do I need to park the rig for truck access? Do I need to park the rig for water supply? Again, have that identified and figured out ahead of time. From there, after we've got the apparatus parked, the next thing is gonna be hose line management, right? Make sure we're getting the hose lines out of the, out of the bed, make sure they're clear, make sure we know where they're going. After we've got hose lines pulled and we're starting to initiate water flow, what's the next thing we're gonna need? It's gonna be water supply. Are you establishing your own water supply? Am I having water supply brought into me? Either way, make sure we have that established and know what's happening. From there, if we need two in, two out, there's a lot of times after, as the apparatus officer, operator, you're gonna be part of the two out. So again, make sure you get your turnouts all on, get your coat on, get your helmet on, get your air pack on, so we're ready to go from there. As we now start getting more resources on scene, you're gonna be you're gonna be crew support. So really, we talk about crew support, this is making sure that the scene itself flows smoothly. If they need the ladders, help them grab a ladder. You know, Just uh, kind of try to identify what they're gonna need before they need it. So I can get a ladder out for them, I can get secondary hose lines out. We can get lights, we can get air packs, we can get uh, air bottles. So if I can start get that ready for the crews, the scene is gonna flow very smoothly for us. 
So a good apparatus operator will make that scene go very smoothly. So where I say that is that if we can anticipate as an apparatus officer operator, we can anticipate what's going to be needed, then the company officer does not have to spend time asking for it. If I know when the hose line goes in, we see black smoke in there, hose line goes in, next thing I see is white smoke. What do I know? I know they put water on the fire. What's the, thing, what's the next thing they're going to need? Well, they're going to need some lights, they're going to need some ventilation. So again, I, should be, I can start prepping that. As soon as they've done that, what's the next thing that's going to happen? Well, they're going to probably want to check the attic, make sure we don't have extension in the attic. What are they going to need? Attic ladder. So again, I can get that as an apparatus office operator. We can go ahead and get that ladder, get a pulley, get a thing at the front door so they don't have to sit there and ask for that. We, we find uh, less experienced people sometimes, they don't, they don't anticipate that. So now if the company officer goes inside, they put the fire out, they get knocked down. Now we have to take time, they got to come out, they got to come back to the apparatus and find the lights and find some fans and go back and put that in place. Now they start getting ready to look for extension. They have to stop what they're doing, come back to the rig, dig that stuff out and take it back and now our whole scene goes longer. The longer the scene goes, the more out of service time we have. The more out of service time we have, that's going to cause secondary uses for us district wide. Who's going to run those extra calls while we're out of service? Who's going to, how many rigs am I tying up on scene while we're messing with all the little stuff? So again, good apparatus operator is going to make the scene go very smoothly for us. All right, so with the engines we talked about, engine's job is to get water onto the fire. What's a truck's job? Well, basically a truck's job, one of two things. The primary mission of the truck is to get the engine to the fire. Secondary, if I can't get the engine to the fire, the fire is going to get bigger. If the fire gets bigger, we're going to elevate its streams. All right, we take a little bit of time here and talk about truck ops. So we talked earlier about trying to figure out our missions and trying to make ourselves a lot more efficient on scene. We're kind of looking at this approach here with trucks. And what we've done with our trucks, we call it truck ops. So we talk about truck ops, basically what we're doing is we're taking a bunch of tasks that need to be done. And instead of me having to get on the radio and micromanage 14 different tasks, I'm just going to sign the truck to do truck ops. The truck understands what they're going to do. From that, when we get into the trucks, we're going to basically going to have a truck A and a truck B. So it's the company officer and the firefighter sitting behind the company officer. That's our truck A. Truck B is going to be the driver and then the firefighter sitting behind them. So when we show up and see the two of them are going to split and they're going to accomplish tasks. The primary mission of the A side is going interior of the structure and doing the support functions that happen on the inside. The B side, their job is primarily to work on the focus on the exterior of it and work on those tasks. All right, historically, when we've looked at the truck operations, the trucks kind of bounce around. They don't necessarily have a true mission. Depending on what department, depending on what part of the country we go to, trucks do completely different things. And this is where we have some of our issues on scenes, is that we have a truck that has its job function of theoretically what it should be doing, but that's not what the crews are doing. They're bouncing around, they're doing all sorts of different things. So when we look at trying to dial in a truck A or truck B into a program, basically what we're doing is we're trying to give that truck some actual parameters. If we give them the parameters to work within, we're going to be very happy with, the, with what we get on scene. This is kind of a new concept for a lot of departments, trying to divide the truck up and do this. We've done studies, right? There's been a lot of different studies out there where they've shown the efficiencies of a two-person crew versus a three-person crew. And if I can take a four-person crew and I can do two and two, we can get twice the work out of what I do out of a single three-person crew. That's where we've kind of dialed in with this truck ops and where we've come up with it. Looking at truck ops, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of talk about what the role of truck A versus truck B is. So truck A, again, right, is the company officer and the firefighter sitting behind them. Their primary thing is inside the structure, right? And like we talked about, their job from, as far as inside the structure ultimately is to get the fire attack crew to the fire. So we show up on scene, what do we want the first thing for the company officer to do? It's going to, again, just like we talked about with the engine ops, first thing I want the officer to do is go ahead and give the crew some direction what they want to get done. From there, traditionally what we're asking truck A to do is go ahead and show up. We want them to give, their, give, uh, give the crew the directions. From there, as they walk up to the structure, we want to get into the structure. So getting into the structure is doing forcible entry. Once we get into the structure, from there is conduct a primary search. If I can conduct the primary search as the truck company, what's that allow the fire crew to do, right? That allows my engine company to get in there and work on getting fire put out. From there, as I'm doing my primary search, it gives me an opportunity to locate the fire. We right, if we're doing there, we're doing a quick search, I find a room of contents fire. We want to slow the fire down. How do I slow the fire down? Well, if I happen to take a water can with me, I can throw some water into the into the room, correct? Now we're trying we're creating that steam. What do I want to do with the steam? Well, if I close the door, that's going to slow the fire down. So again, that's our locate and confine for the fire. From there, as we're continuing our inside primary search, we can go ahead and catch the inside utilities. Go ahead and shut off the breaker on there. From there, get the breaker. If there's gas lines inside, great. Typically, a gas line should be outside, but every now and then, depending on part of the country we're in, depending on what kind of who did the remodels, we might find gas lines in different locations. But primarily, get the utilities. Once that's done, then we can come out and reassess. 
All right, so on the truck ops, firefighter A, who sits directly behind the company officer, they're basically just mirroring the company officer. They're the hands for the company officer. Company officer is kind of directing, firefighter A is the doing. So again, they're gonna show up. Their job when they walk up to the structure is to take the equipment they need to do forcible entry so they can force their way into the structure so we get the engine company in there. And again, firefighter A is just simply gonna assist with the primary search. They're gonna assist with locate and confine and go ahead again, work on the inside utility. So the two of those, the company officer and the firefighter A, which sits directly behind the company officer, they're showing up and that's their job is inside. When we're talking about truck ops, we have truck A, whose their primary job is going inside the structure. We have truck B, truck B's job is the primary outside structure support. So we show up on scene with truck B, so truck B is gonna be the driver and then the person sitting behind them. So either it's gonna be the firefighters that sits behind the driver or it's gonna be the tiller person if I'm running a tiller. So those two people are gonna make up our truck B group. From there, we show up on scene. What do I want the driver to be focused on? I want the driver to show up, work on apparatus placement, park the truck correctly. Whether we're blocking the scene, whether we're gonna set the stick up, figure out what we're gonna do and set the truck that way. From there, work on getting the truck set up. So we might not necessarily unbed the ladder, but if we get in the habit of setting the outriggers out, putting the, putting the pads down, putting the jacks out, and getting the truck ready to go, that helps us get in that habit on scene so it's second nature, and also helps the rest of the companies on scene understand and realize the size of the truck is and understand the footprint so they're not parking the rigs to block us. From there, we're gonna go ahead and work on doing a ventilation assessment. What is it, what are they needed? Are we needing to do horizontal? We need to do vertical. From there, we're gonna go ahead and get the ventilation figured out and make it happen. So if we need to go vertical, we're doing vertical. If we're going horizontal, we're gonna go horizontal. After that's done, our kind of our transition from there is to start thinking about salvage. So what do we need for salvage? Are we needing, our, are we needing covers? Are we needing salvage tubs? Are we needing whatever you need? Work on that. All right, for truck B, where does truck B go sideways? Most often truck B goes sideways when we are working on apparatus placement. So we say that is when we show up on scene, I wanna give the truck the address. The truck's got limited reach with the aerial. The truck has got limited reach with all the different equipment on there. If we're running lights, so we need to pull off light reels off of the rig. If we're running tools, I don't wanna be walking half mile carrying my saws back and forth. So give the truck that placement. If we, do, if we don't get that address location for the truck, now all of a sudden the whole rest of the call is not gonna go well for us. So as far as thinking about apparatus placement, a couple things we want to keep in the back of your mind. I've got a lot of hose on my engines. If I pull an engine 20 feet past my address, I can still reach everything I need to with my hose lines. If I pull the engine 20 feet past, I can still take my ground ladders off and reach the structure with them. Now let's take our aerial. I've got a limited reach with my stick. If I can't get that truck right at the, right at the front of the structure and be able to reach everything, I can't pull that truck 20 feet past and still reach what I want to. We need to make sure we leave that front of the address open for the truck. So as far as kind of our mindset, our culture on the engines, get that mindset, pull the engine past the scene or stop short of the scene. Either way, you know, figure out what works best for you, but leave that address for the truck. Think about your hose line placement. If I lay my supply line right down the center street and I charge it before the truck gets there, can I get the truck into where it needs to be? If I park my engines in the middle of the street versus off the side of the street, can I still get that truck into there? We block that. Right? On the truck side of it, be thinking about your outriggers, right? Am I leaving enough room to get my outriggers out and down? Am I putting the outriggers on a solid surface on the road deck? Or we end up trying to put our outriggers on the sidewalk? Think about if you put your outriggers on the sidewalk, what's underneath those for support? Usually two and a half, three inches of concrete is all we have. You're gonna punch through that and we're gonna tip the truck over. So again, just be thinking about when we shut up on scene, how do we set that up? From there, just good habits. If you get in the habit of every time I show up on a, on a fire, whether it's working or not, if, I get, if we're new to the truck, show up, get your outriggers out and down every single time. If I do that, that starts creating habits for you and that helps you understand where you need to put the truck and your placement of the truck. That also helps our engine crews to understand, look at the size, look at the footprint of the truck. If they see that every time on calls, they're gonna realize the size they need and where they need to leave for you. So if we can do that, set the truck up every time, leave the access in there and just kind of drill it into our people, our scenes are gonna go a lot better for us. All right, so Firefighter B, we're under the Truck Ops program, right? Where Truck A's doing his job, Truck B's doing his job. Firefighter B, or the tiller person, right? That's the person sitting behind the, off, the driver of the rig. Their job is basically gonna assist with the, with the exterior operations. So within that, they're gonna be a set, of, set of eyes for command. They're gonna do a 360. We're gonna ask them to do what they're doing their 360s is to tie in multiple job functions. So we're gonna, when they're doing the 360, we want them to go ahead and get the outside utilities of the structure. If I got breakers, they can shut off, great. If I got gas lines shut off, great, shut those off. While they're completing their 360, take a ladder with you. If I can get to that tri side of the structure and I can throw a ladder back there, we've now established secondary means of egress while I'm accomplishing my outside utilities and I'm also accomplishing my 360. So again, that's gonna be multiple jobs all in one pass of the structure. 
From there, we're going to go assist with ventilation. So during that time frame, I'm kind of looking, right, if I'm Firefighter B, I'm looking at the structure, kind of looking at what is it telling me. I'm going to get back to the front of the structure. We're going to confer with the driver. Hey, here's what I'm thinking for a ventilation plan. Make our plan, communicate that with command, and go ahead and initiate it. Again, once the ventilation's done, our next thing is going to be working with the driver of the truck, right? And we're going to go ahead and work on salvage operations. All right, as far as the truck ops goes, if you're kind of looking at most of what we're doing, this doesn't necessarily have to be a truck. So let's say we're in an apartment where my first two, three rigs out the door are engines, or I don't have a truck. I can still take the first in engine could show up and could be taking fire attack. My second in engine, I can still sign them truck ops. If you look at primarily what we're doing here, it's, it's more of the functions than the apparatus itself. So if we show up residential, truck's not really necessarily needed, I can go ahead and ask my engine company to do the truck ops program. And go ahead now, my second engine is gonna go through and knock out these tasks for us. All right, so for our trucks, truck ops is not always the answer. Where I say that, if we showed up, and we say we had a working apartment fire. What's our priority in an apartment fire? So it's gonna be search, right? So something that our, our company officer or command might assign the truck instead of showing up and, and taking that traditional truck ops role, is I could sole source the entire truck company to all go doing searches and clearing the structure. We might have ventilation as a need, right? We show up, hey, vertical ventilation needs to happen, it needs to happen right now. I might sole source the entire truck company to get up there and get those vertical ventilations done. We've got up here just kind of an example of how we might do that. But again, every department's gonna be a little bit different, figure out what works best for you. But again, the goal here, if we've pre, pre assigned our seat roles, when whoever's working the truck, when they're sitting in that seat, they're not trying to guess all of a sudden what happens on scene. They know what's gonna, what their job is. What are we asking of our heavy rescues on scene? If you happen to be lucky enough to have, a heavy, to have a heavy rescue in your system, a lot of times we'll give them RIT as their primary job function on scene. So show up, one of the things that we've done that's worked very well for us is we've actually taken a Stokes basket and we've preloaded it with all of our RIT gear. So we show up on scene, I sign the heavy rescue RIT, they're not going through and trying to do a yard sale shopping of the, of the apparatus, trying to dig out everything they want. They simply open one compartment, grab that Stokes basket out, and it's all preloaded and ready to go. So from there, beyond RIT, they're, a lot of times they're kind of our wild card on scene for us. So I like to use them as our, as our problem solver. So we show up on scene, things aren't quite going well, they're a great set of eyes for us. They don't have a necessarily a true fire attack function. They don't necessarily have a true search or ventilation function. So they're kind of bouncing around a little bit and they're the ones that can give us some ideas of problems that they see and help us solve the problems. Where do we see heavy rescue operations go sideways? It's when they start freelancing. If their job is RIT, or their job is just kind of keep an eye on the scene. As soon as they start getting involved tactically, they start putting, they start running hose lines. They start cutting ventilation holes. They're no longer in RIT. They're no longer in that observation or that problem solving mode. They're now tactical mode. So if they into that, they jump into that mode now and all of a sudden I need a RIT activation, where's my crew at? Well, they're tied up. I have to try to pull them out. We're not getting an immediate RIT activation. So again, if you're assigned to RIT, your job is RIT. If you're assigned to observe, then your job is observing. If you think you need to change roles, communicate that with command. And if you need to be assigned into tactical operations, then they can backfill your RIT position. Let's look at tactical priorities for us on scene. So when we show up on scene for tactical priorities, we're gonna have engine, engines jobs, truck jobs, heavy rescue jobs. Typically our first in engines job is doing fire attack. From there, what's our second in engines job? A lot of times second in engine is gonna be bringing in water supply. If you think about command, if I've got my first in engine company has already done a 360, and they've initiated some fire attack, what company officer is gonna be the best to jump in and lead that fire attack crew? It's gonna probably be that first in company officer. So a lot of times our second in engine will take command until we get a overall commander showing up. So engine, second, engine, second in engine company, bring in water supply and take command. From there, what's our truck gonna do? Our truck's gonna typically show up and they're gonna do truck A, truck B functions. What's our heavy rescue gonna do? They're gonna come rolling in and they're gonna go ahead and establish RIT and then there are problem solvers. Tactical priorities for engines on working fires. Initially, when they show up, we talked about it before, but it's gonna kinda of drive it home, get water on the fire. So if we get it from the outside of the structure and start slowing that fire down. From there, get a 360, figure out what is the structure, what do I have, what am I working with, where is the seat of the fire? Once we establish that, we can go ahead, we can shut off that hose line from the outside and we can jump inside, right? Just grab another hose line and go inside and find the seat of the fire and put it out. That's gonna be our first in engine. What happens when we get our second in engine coming in? Second in engine, go ahead and bring us a water supply if we've not been able to establish it off the first engine. Again, like we talked about, a lot of times I'm gonna want that company officer off the first in engine going in and assisting with fire attack. So what's second in engine's company officer gonna do? They're gonna take command for us. From there, now we start getting additional rigs showing up. I start getting third engine, fourth engine. Do I need the apparatus? 
If I need the apparatus, we'll bring them in. If I don't need the apparatus, that's just gonna plug the scene up and make things a lot harder for us to operate in. So think about basing the apparatus. Maybe I'm gonna base the rigs, I'm gonna base them a block away and just have the crews walk up, because a lot of times I just need the people, I don't need the rig, right? So again, keep that scene clean and neat, neat and orderly for us. If I start stacking up a bunch of rigs, now how do I get the truck in? How do I get my heavy rescue in if I block the scene up with, with engines? So park the, base the engines away, bring the people up and do the work. Something to think about when we start talking about bringing in second, third, fourth in engines and where we're going to park them, where we're going to base them at, is think about traffic. Do we need traffic assistance? Do we need to have PD there to help us block roads? From there, it kind of brings us up to a point that we had in the past, you know, right? we've all experienced this where we've either had, we've shown up and I couldn't get to the fire because I had an officer had parked their rig to shut the road down, thinking they were helping us and they actually blocked us from getting to the call. Vice versa, have we ever shown up and we've parked in the middle of their scene and screwed up the investigation for them? One of the things that we've found has worked very good to kind of work with this is actually go ahead and do some ride-alongs with each other. If we can go ahead and ride a shift on the fire side of it, if we can take our company officer, ride a shift with the officer on the police side of it and see what they do and how they do things. And then the flip side is have them come ride a shift with us and look at how we're showing up on scenes, what our mindset is. It makes for a whole lot smoother working relationship on scenes. We're able to understand what are they parking, why are they parking, where are we parking? How can we help them do their job better? How can they help us do our job better? And that's been very successful for us, and I'd recommend trying it on your end as well. Tactical priorities for trucks on scenes. If you show up on a working fire, what is a truck's job, right? Like we talked about earlier, the truck's job is to get the engine to the fire. So within that, we're gonna work on forcible entry to get the engine in. Work on ventilation so I can get the engine, again, if I can, if I can clear the air, get the heat out, the engine can get their hose line in deeper where they need to get right off the get-go. Search rescue. If I can do that as a truck company, it now leaves the engine free to get their lines stretched, get their lines into position. From there, working on secondary egress. If we're working off a secondary floor, third floor, fourth floor, what do I want? I need a backup plan. If things go wrong, how am I getting out? That's the truck's job to take care of that for us. We talked earlier about truck ops, about having the truck A, the truck B. We also talked about sole sourcing trucks. So one of the things that kind of think about operation for you on scene, if we show up and you've got your first in truck, we might assign my first in truck to do truck A, truck B work, right? We'd be doing truck ops. Well, now say we're in a bigger situation, I have got multiple trucks coming in. I could sole source a truck. So where I say that is I could sole source my first in truck just to search. I could sole source my second truck to ventilation. The other thing we could potentially do, if I've got two trucks coming in clo closely and I've got a big enough fire, I might sole source my first in truck just to do truck A functions. My secondary truck might be all just the truck B functions. So again, they're fluid and they move depending on what we have on scene. They're not necessarily set in stone, but the more the goal of it is setting those tasks so we understand the lanes that we're traveling in. From there, assign the trucks to the lane that you want them to work in and you're gonna have success. One of the things that we've looked at and we've fought a long time in the fire service is running calls with, with mutual aid departments. So from there, we're, we've got our EMS protocols that we typically run and we're trying to get those set up for countywide, right? So we don't have different conflicting EMS protocols as we're running calls around the county. We've also got fire protocols set up. So within our fire protocols, something that we've been doing is we've kind of been outlining when we show up on scene, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna do it. If we can take and share these fire protocols with all of our mutual aid companies, now all of a sudden we're, we're all working off the same page. If we're working off the same page, now we start getting those mutual aid trucks coming in, I don't have to try to figure out what we're gonna do. Get those mutual aid, mutual aid engines coming in. I can just assign them, hey, here's the fire protocols, I want you to do in, second in engines job. I want you to do third in engines job. Now that takes away the issues of mutual aid and it's gonna make us work a lot better and be a lot more successful on scene. Tactical priorities for heavy rescues on scene. If you're lucky enough to have a heavy rescue, dedicated heavy rescue, we show up on scene and a lot of times what we want initially for them to do is we all wanna give them the writ. I want them to just know writ and own writ. So when they get on scene, again, I don't have to try to have all my entire department understanding what they're doing, but they dial down the specific details and then that's the heavy rescue's job. From there, part of writ is tracking our, is tracking our crew locations. Where are people at if they're having problems? Listen to the radios. Are people sounding a little stressed on the radio? Are they sounding low on air? Keeping track of time, how long have people been in on air on us, right? It's gonna give us an idea of what's going on. From there, you're also, because you're doing loops around the building, kind of sizing it up and figuring out what's our rescue plan is gonna be, you're kind of an unofficial safety officer as well. So as you're bouncing around the structure, you're seeing issues. If you see issues, what do we do? We're gonna communicate that to safety or communicate that to command. And hopefully from there, we're gonna have success and be, have a good fire. We've talked about staying in your lane and we've also talked about some primary skill sets. Let's dial down to this. So let's talk about what is the engine's actual primary skill set they need to focus on. What's the truck's primary skill set? What's the heavy rescue skill set? 
If we can dial those down, we're gonna, have, we're gonna be successful fires, we're gonna get our fires put out, and we're gonna save lives, and we're not gonna get ourselves hurt. Primary skill set for engine. What's an engine's job? It's put water on the fire, right? So if we think about their primary job of putting water on the fire, that kind of helps us dial in what the primary skill set is. So from there, really, it's hose line deployment, right? How do I get the correct hose line out there? How do I get it moved? How do I get it into position? How do I get water on the fire? From there, as we're doing that, we need to be thinking about situational awareness, right? As we're going advancing ourselves into the structure, what's happening around me? Don't get focused in on just that hose line. Think about the surroundings. Am I in a safe environment? Is there things in the, in the, around me that are telling me I need to be out of there? Are there things around there that are telling me I need a different size hose line? From there, we think about water supply, right? The bigger the hose line I'm flowing, the more water I'm gonna use. The more water, the quicker I'm gonna need a, a water supply. From there, if things aren't going well, we're gonna to need to be thinking about supporting aerial operations. So we talk about supporting aerial operations. When we show up, be thinking about the hydrants that we're gonna take. If I'm taking a yard hydrant inside of a commercial structure, what's the supply line that feeds that yard hydrant? Am I gonna be better off actually taking the hydrant from the street and bring it in if I'm gonna be supporting aerial ops, right? So you think about it, a lot of times yard hydrants might be a four or six inch water main. The water main out in the street might be a 12 inch water main, which is gonna, what's gonna give us more water. So we show up, commercial fire, lots of water. I know I'm gonna go vertical vent or I'm gonna go to aerial operations. Be thinking about that water supply and think about what hydrant we take and be successful with that as well. If you're not comfortable with your skill set, you're gonna end up bouncing out of your lane and going into a skill set that you're comfortable with. If you bounce out of your lane into a different skill set that you're more comfortable with, guess what happens? We don't accomplish our mission. Primary skill set for our truck companies. So if you think about it on scene, right, truck's job is to assist the engine, get the engine into where they need to be, let the engine be free to get hose lines in place, and not be worried about doing searches, not be worried about forcing doors. So if we think about that, right, what's our primary skill set for a truck? Well, it's gonna be forcible entry. We need to be good at it, we need to be practiced at it. From there, ventilation. We just think about ventilating a structure. Is that something that we have 15 minutes to accomplish, or is that something we need to get done in the first five minutes on scene? Right? Something we need to get done right away. The only way to get done right away is to be confident in what we show up and how we assess it and how we accomplish it. From there, think about vent enter searches. Right? What's going to allow the company, the hose lines, to get and worry about where they need to be? If they're not have to worry about doing vent enter searches, we can focus on getting into bedrooms and that way, vent enter searches from the outside, we're leaving the interior structure free for hose line advancement. From there, ground ladders, right? We're not going to be successful with vent inner searches unless I'm good with my ground line, unless I'm successful with my ground ladder placement. From there, if things are going to go bigger for us, aerial operations. So again, staying in our lanes, make sure that we know how to set the truck up, make sure we're putting the truck in the correct location, make sure we're comfortable putting the outriggers out, make sure we're comfortable with checking our overheads. Am I spotting the truck with a turntable in the correct locations? So again, make sure we're good with all those skills and we're going to be successful. As we're working through this, these skill sets, your job is to stay within your lane. If you need to change lanes, that's command's job is to talk, you need to communicate that with command, and command is the one that will tell you to change lanes. We don't want you on scene just randomly bouncing between lanes. If you think you need to change lanes, call command and communicate that with command. Heavy rescue on a working fire is about the attitude. So a lot of that where we say that is we need a rig, right? Your job in heavy rescue is not engine work. Your job in heavy rescue is not truck work. Your job in heavy rescue is RIT. So understanding RIT and being proactive in it. So we need to understand the RIT skills. We need to understand how do I do breaching breaking of concrete walls? How do I do breaching breaking masonry walls? How do I do breaching breaking through metal walls? Right? Think about that. How am I going to get in? How am I going to get my people out? From there, be proactive with it. So on scene, this is going to be kind of the, the toughest rig to kind of stay in your lane with, but really within proactive, we need to soften the structure. So about softening the structure is think about where your crews are at. If I've got a man door that I need to be able to get through to gain access to my crews, maybe I'm going to go ahead and force that door. And I'll bring it close so I can maintain the structural, the, the, the air track inside the structure, but have that door ready to go through if I need to. From there, learn the buildings in your area. Go through, do walkthroughs ahead of time. Figure out what are my danger buildings? What are the buildings that have concerns for me? From there, go ahead and track, right? We get our working calls. Make sure we're tracking our crews. Where are my crews at? If I got a May Day from Engine 4, be listening to the radio. Do I know where Engine 4 is at? Right? So I know you understand where they're at. Listen to the communications. Are the people sounding stressed? Are they sounding low on air? From there, we need to understand building collapse. As we talk about building collapse, we start getting a big working fire. We start to have some partial collapses of the structure. How's that going to impact my ability to get into the fire? If I'm looking at the walls and I'm seeing that wall starting to get ready, get ready to collapse, do I want to breach that wall to get my fire crews out? Well, if I breach that wall, am I going to cause additional collapse? So we need to understand building construction, make sure we're comfortable with it, and we know where to and how to breach. 
So that's going to be our primary job. So again, really it all ties back into my set of our heavy rescue on a fire is how do I get to my crews and how do I get my crews out if I need to. As we continue down this path, talking about staying near lane, let's talk about efficiency and how to efficiently use our crews on scenes. So we talked a little bit earlier about the truck ops program. So within the truck ops program, instead of doing our traditional assigning a crew to do forcible entry, then assigning a crew to do a primary search, and then assigning a crew to do an isolate, uh, locate and isolate on the, on the fire, right? If I do the truck ops, I'm actually gonna accomplish all of those tasks with one crew with one pass. So that's kind of where our truck ops program comes from. So when we talk about it, Right? Ultimately, our truck ops company operations, those are operations that may not get accomplished in a timely manner by an engine company due to their need to advance hose lines. Right? So we think about it again, right? what's the job of an engine company? Is to get hose lines in there. What's the job of the truck company? It's to make the hose line advancement easier. That's how we're utilizing our truck crews to be efficient. Effectively splitting your crew. One of the things we've looked at is to split the crew or not to split the crew. Realistically, the scene tells you what you need. So we show up on scene if it's appropriate, like we talked about with our truck ops, if it's appropriate to show up and split my crew into truck A, truck B, then that's what we're going to do. If we show up on the scene and like, hey, our priority is we really need to get a search done, we're going to sole source the truck just to search, right? So again, think about that. On scenes, let the scene tell you, have, that, have those plays ready to go in your playbook, right? So we show up on scene, I know which one I can, if I need to do it, I'm going to pull out that individual task, but have those tasks predetermined. So when I tell the crew we're going to sole source to this function or we're going to do truck ops to this function, we know and we're able to jump into that role easily and we know what our jobs are. When we're talking about splitting our crew, not splitting our crew, the ultimate decision falls to command. As a company officer though, you're on the, your boots on the ground, you're sitting there looking at the scene, you're able to evaluate it. Very quickly, you should be able to make recommendations to command. If command tells you truck ops, maybe I'm going to get on the radio and say, hey, command from truck, I see this issue, I'd recommend we sole source the search. Right, make that recommendation. Now command can still go ahead and say, nope, I want you to continue to truck ops, or command can reevaluate that and divert you all to search. Let's talk about how we set our apparatus up for success. So if we know the missions of the apparatus, carry the equipment that meets those missions. So a lot of times this is where we see departments that have got rigs that are kind of clustered up because there's a lot of different equipment on the rigs. So if we know that a fire engine's job is to put water on the fire, what needs to be on the engine? Hose lines. Is a truck's job to put water on the fire? No. So do I need to have a bunch of hose on the truck? No. Whose job is to do ventilation? Well, ventilation is truck's job, right? So who needs to carry the bulk of the ventilation equipment? The truck does. Now, where that would vary for us, so let's say we're in a, in a department where I don't have a truck company available to me. Maybe I take a look at my engines. Maybe I set one engine up more engine task heavy, and I set the other tr the engine up more truck task heavy. So that way, again, when we show up on scene, I've got rigs that can do the jobs correctly. From there, look at how we mount and carry our equipment. Is your equipment carried in a way that I can pull it off and I'm ready to go? Is it carried in a way that I have to pull off three different things and hook them all together then to be able to operate it? From there, look at grouping your equipment, right? So again, we've talked about this in the past, but if I show up for an extrication, do I, can I open one compartment and everything I need is there to go do my extrication? Or am I gonna show up a scene and I've gotta to go to one compartment to grab some step shocks? I gotta to go to another compartment to grab and another department to grab, right? Every time I go to a different compartment, it's gonna slow down our calls for us. Slow down the calls, they don't go as well for us. We've talked earlier about understanding your missions and understanding your roles. And from there, we also talked about a little bit of seat assignments. When we look at our engines and how do I want to set my engine up for success, this is basically we take all the stuff we talked about ahead of time and we set our rigs up like that. So if we take a look at the engine itself and how do I set stuff up, if I know that firefighter off the A side, their job is getting into the structure and starting all the mission critical stuff, then that's where my mission critical gear goes on their engines. Right? If we look at departments, we don't very often have engines that are identical. We have engines from different generations, different brands, different years, and they're all slightly different. But if I have a general layout, that allows me to walk up to whatever engine it is and be able to find quickly what I want. So we look at our engines, right? Set up, our, set up the initial, the inside for forceful entry, our fire tech, our search rescue, EMS, so that's all mission critical stuff. That goes on the right side. What's the left side? That's gonna be our pump operations, right? So all of our hose lines, all of our appliances, our ventilation and traffic control. So again, to show up on scene, right? If we've got a traffic issue, I don't want the driver to have to get out and walk all the way around the rig to find their cones. Put the cones right where the driver can get to them and get them out quickly and get the scenes secured. I don't want, we show up and fire attack crew, I don't want them to come out of the rig and have to do a 360 rig to find the equipment they need. We want it right off their site and they can get working. So again, just baseline for us, mission critical right, support left. 
As we talk about setting the rigs up for success, I got a couple examples for you. The first one here, looking at the picture on the left, this is how we've always seen a gravel ladder stored on the rigs. I've got the extension ladder on the inside, the roof ladder's first off. When we show up a scene, what's the critical functions? It's going to be doing a second story egress, right? It's going to be getting somebody out of a structure, doing a rescue. Or if we're going to do show up and we're going to do ventilated roof, what's the first thing that needs to go up? Well, I need to put the extension ladder up first, and then the roofer goes secondary to that. Well, why are we storing our, our ladders with the roof ladder on the outside? So now I show up on scene, I got to take the roofer out of the way to get the extension ladder. If you look at the picture on the right, they've actually taken flip these. They've put the extension ladders first off and the roofers on the inside. So that way those ladders come off, they're pulling them off, how they want to utilize the ladders. So again, why do we do it this way? Probably because that's how it's always been versus us to take a minute and look at how we're accomplishing the mission, set the rig up to meet the mission and have success. Our second example of setting the rigs up for success, we've got two different vehicles here with struts set on them. You see the first rig, it's a beautiful mounting bracket they've done, but if you look at the struts and when they pull the struts off, they have to pull the struts off, they have to assemble them. The heads are off of the strut, the feet are off the strut. So we get on scene, I want to throw a strut quickly, I got to first take five minutes and try to remember how to put the whole thing together. If you look at the picture on the right, their struts are pre-assembled. They can show up, throw the door open, grab the strut out of the compartment and set it and they're ready to go. So again, just think about how we set the rigs up and necessarily, sometimes we'll set the rigs up that way because that's what fits. Well, if it's the way it fits, Maybe we look at a different compartment. Maybe we look at when we spec the rigs a little differently, but build it and set them up so that I can grab it ready to go versus build and have to put it together for us. As we continue to talk about apparatus set up for success, when we look at our trucks, we're going to keep that same principle we did with the trucks as we do with our engines. So we say that is our mission critical stuff typically is going to stay on the right side. Support stuff's going to typically stay on the left side. So we show up on scene and our, again, forest entry, search, rescue, EMS, stuff comes off the right side. Our ventilation, aerial ops, traffic op, traffic control, all comes off of the left side. We spoke earlier about missions and about primary skill sets. Well, if we're looking at truck A, truck B, as far as really dialing down our equipment, if we know the truck A's forest entry, search, locate, confine, inside utilities, verify extension, that kind of tells me what equipment's going to go down that side. If we know the truck B group is, pretty, is primarily going to do aerial operations, multiple means of egress, ventilation, what goes on their side, right? So if we're going to have our saws, our fans are coming off the truck B side, our forceful entry tools, our extinguishers are coming off the truck A side. So again, it doesn't really matter what brand truck we've got, what style truck we have, what year truck it is. If we kind of set them up mission critical like that, between mission critical and support, if we're able to get our mutual aid companies to do the same thing, I show up on scene, it's not necessarily my rig, but I still know what side of the rig to go to look for the equipment on. Let's look at MVCs as far as our missions on them. What's our engine going to do? What's our truck? What's our heavy rescue? So again, this is going to vary a little bit depending on your resources, depending on what, how, your, how your department's set up. But if we take a traditional engine truck heavy rescue, here's kind of some ways to look at how we split up the resources and the missions on scenes. Initially showing up on scene on a Trapman MVC, what's my engine's job? Initially it's going to be scene stabilization. Right? Shutting down the roadway, making the safe place for us to work, getting up to the car, prepping the car, looking at what, what needs to happen. How's the entrapment happened? How are we going to get the person out? What's our game plan? How can I get the car prepped for the actual extrication? From there, we're also going to take care of patient care. Whose job is going to be patient's care? It's going to be the engine's job. As our trucks are showing up on scene, we're going to ask them to get into a little bit more. So they're going to do the primary vehicle stabilization if we got anything other than just car on its tires. So we get car on its side, car on its stop. We're going to have the trucks come in and do a stabilization of them. From there, we're going to have the trucks come in and do the extrication. But again, depending on department-wise, if you've got a department set up that doesn't have the trucks in that capacity, we're going to be doing that work with the engine. So again, but be thinking about that. If I have the first engine in wants to do, if I have my first engine in, I'm asking them to stabilize the scene, do patient care, do vehicle stabilization, do extrication. That's a lot of work for one engine. So I might even just simply take these tasks and split them between crews. I might have my first crew in do the scene stabilization and do the patient care. My second crew would come in and do advanced stabilization of the vehicle and work on the extrication. So again, it doesn't necessarily have to be about the rig as much as setting up the missions of each crew. We set those missions up, we'll have a successful extrication. Heavy rescues on our car wrecks. So a heavy rescue is not something that I'm going to necessarily need access to or need to bring out in every single car wreck. We typically bring our heavy rescues out is when we've got those advanced calls. So we've got an advanced stabilization issue. We've got cars that are up on top of landscape boulders. We've got cars that are on top of other cars. Cars that are on top of boats in residential areas. That's where we're going to bring our heavy rescue in. What about if we've got advanced, we've got heavy equipment? So we're dealing with construction equipment. We're dealing with industrial. Or a picture we've got in here is also is a concrete truck on site on top of a car. 
that's kind of where we're going to start bringing in those bigger resources of the heavy rescue. So really, I don't want to necessarily tie up my engine companies, my truck companies. I don't want to necessarily tie up all of their training time, all of their resources with these very few and far between calls. That's more where specialized equipment comes into, which is where my heavy rescue comes into. So that's where we're going to bring the heavy rescues versus the trucks versus engines. But again, ultimately the goal of this, we show up on scene is basically is figure out tasks I need to accomplish. And if I can assign a certain task, let that company complete it. Start the second task, let them complete it, get a third task. And if we're able to focus on those tasks, the scene will flow very smoothly for us and we'll have a lot of success.